Why hello everyone, welcome back. Are you stressed? Because I am! Let's start off this video just like we did the last one, apologising for this glasses thing. Yes, I'm aware, but I need sight, you're gonna have to deal with the shiny light. Um, am I wearing the same jumper I was wearing in the last video? Yes I am! But that doesn't matter because today I'm here to help you with paper two of the English language A level. Look at this bad boy. Ugh. My favourite folder is back, the biggest folder I've ever had before. That is my English language A-level folder. Um, but we've already looked at all of the paper one stuff. Uh, if you haven't seen that video, I'll link it somewhere, hopefully. But if you're doing the real A-level this year, paper one has been and gone. Don't worry about what you've already done paper one. That's in the past, you can't change it. After paper two, I came home and sobbed. But then what happened? I got an A-star in the end. So you just can't predict how an exam goes. You'll never know. Um, so today we're going to cover sort of the key points you have to do in paper two to get the high grades. Um, I'm going to go over my past uh, exam questions, uh, talk about what I did well, what I didn't do well, why I got high grades, why I got low grades. We're going to look at some of my notes that I made, um, talk about learning theory. We're going to look at the AOs and sort of the criteria you need to hit and sort of just go through how to structure an answer to all of the paper two questions. So let's do this thing. Paper two, what's involved? It's two and a half hours long, section A and section B. Section A is diversity and change. You've got 45 minutes for section A, you're marked on AO1 and AO2. There's 30 marks available altogether, AO1 is 10 marks, AO2 is 20 marks. You're going to get a choice of two questions. One will be on an area of language diversity and the other one will always be on language change. Language change will always come up every year. That is confirmed. The exam board has said language change will be on the paper. So learn language change. But when we talk about diversity, we're talking about occupation, ethnicity, world Englishes, gender, accent and dialect, those kind of things. Um, I would say be prepared to apply that theory to a question that isn't specifically about one of those areas. They could combine the areas, or like last year, they could just, poof, make a brand new area up that no one's been taught about. But that's by the by. It's in the past. It's in the past. I'm over it. So, example questions for section A, diversity and change. Evaluate the idea that men and women use language differently, or evaluate the factors that affect a people's use of regional dialect. Interesting. Um, section B is language discourses. You've got question three and question four. Question three is on two texts that are based on the same topic. You'll be asked to analyse how language is used in text A and text B. You'll be asked how language is used to prevent... You'll be asked how language and... You will be asked how language is used to prevent... Oh my god, uh, B. You will be asked how language is used to prevent present different views across text A and text B. I'm clearly very literate for someone who got an A star in English language GCSE. A level! Oh my god, there's hope for all of you. So for question three, you'll have 15 minutes to prepare the texts and 45 minutes to write it. That question is worth first that question is worth 40 marks. You'll have AO1, 10 marks, AO3, 15 marks, AO4, 15 marks. Um, question four is your own opinion piece, an article based on the subject of the issues that were raised in question three, and you have to bring in theory and it's for a non-specialist audience. 45 minutes to write that, 30 marks. Uh, AO2 is 20 marks, AO5 is 10 marks. That's five marks. 10 marks. <clears throat> so that's the exam. That's the that's the big old gist of it. Anyway, now on to the theory essay. This one is really tricky if you just don't know the theory really well. Um, learn it well, be able to apply it, be able to evaluate it are the main key things you need to be able to do. This is about a specific question, so I'm not going to go into spe specifics about what they say, but this is feedback from AQA on a language change question. And what they come up with time and time again is explained clearly range of examples showing how examined explored um examined explained evaluated explored considered supported their argument with detailed examples throughout the answer so explain everything develop theory 
that is the main thing, develop it. Say, but this was created a long time ago, or it's not supported enough, or other theorists argue this instead. You don't have to agree with what theorists say. <laughs> Let's start on the AO1s first. AO1, uh, 10 marks, apply appropriate methods of language analysis, analysis using associated terminology and coherent written expression. AO2, demonstrate critical understanding of concepts and issues relevant to language use. So, in here they write suggestions for further improvement and they sort of circle what you need to improve on. Um, so here are points that you might need to improve on. Clearer written English, more theory, more development of theory, more focus on the question, clearer argument, more organised structure to answers, more arguments, uh, more evaluation and challenge of views, a range of language methods, better use of linguistic terminology, more counter argument, more linguistic detail, more identification and comment on different views, more examples from your own study. Um, I would just like to show you that um, in this theory essay, I got a B minus slash a C plus, and in this one, I got a C. Um, and overall, I got an A star. So don't worry, <laughs> it will be okay. If you're in first year and not your second year of college, um, you've got so much time to improve. Um, so here I've got an outline for the theory essay. Um, I've got introduction, define any keywords in the question, give examples, show you understand what the two sides of the argument are. It won't necessarily be a two-sided argument though, show you understand that a variety of factors impact our language use. You want four to five main paragraphs with four to five elements of detailed theory. Um, for each piece of theory, uh, talk about what the theorist was interested in, what did they do, what were their research, what was their methods, what did they find out, and you can give some mild criticism. Um, for example, it could be argued that Lebov's research methods weren't especially rigorous and that this data is now rather outdated. Um, you want to link all your theory back to the question, address the question in every single paragraph. Just signpost to the marker, look, this answers the question, this also definitely answers the question because I'm telling you why it does here. Then there can be no confusion that you 100% are answering the question. Bring in the theory that you feel most clearly identifies the question. Don't just list all the gender theory that you've learned for gender. Read the question. It could be very specific and then apply what's most appropriate. If it's a question about gender, but something about language change fits really well, use that theory. Um, you want a short conclusion as well. Sum up your findings. Show how a variety of factors affect our language use and always mention communities of practice. Okay, on this essay I got 28 out of 30. It says, a well-argued, effectively linked and knowledgeable response that guides the reader towards your conclusions. Guide them towards your conclusion. So I start with my introduction. A person's language consists of their grammar use, syntax use and semantic use, defining key terms. Um, social groups can be friendship groups, work colleague groups, ethnicity groups, etc, defining a key term. Um, but in each circumstance, groups normally have a distinct social that features certain lingu linguistic norms. That can often mean that a person's language use is completely determined by the social group. However, many others disagree, already acknowledging both sides of the argument. Milroy and Milroy conducted an investigation in inner city Belfast. They used a snowball effect to work their way into tightly knit community, working class communities. So again, who are they? What are they interested in? How did they go about collecting their research? They gave each individual a score from one to five based on how integrated in the community they were and found that a higher social network score correlated with higher usage of non-standard forms. This evidence suggests that individuals subconsciously use language to establish group solidarity. However, this investigation only took into account one community in inner Belfast. It didn't consider many other nightly knit communities around the country. So I'm saying this is what their research showed, but I'm giving it a wee bit of criticism too. And that's what I do for one, two, three, four, five, five different theorists all together um, for opposing views as well. Um, and then I have a short conclusion. I say, in conclusion, social groups have a large impact on an individual's language. This is clearly demonstrated by Penelope Eckert's ideas of communities of practice. However, they don't solely control your language. The ability to code switch shows you can speak in many different ways depending on context. So again, even in the end, I'm bringing in the most important theory area maybe from that essay, but I'm still critiquing it. Here's some exam feedback we had for our whole class. Um, so for question one slash two, the theory essay, relevant theory, don't just chuck it in, engage with the theorist, contextualise them, say it's outdated, challenge it, give evidence and specific examples, how does it relate to the question, don't give too little but don't give too many, give good detail, 
do use the terminology. So you could say in the verb running, the final G was dropped. Um, clarify the genders of the theorists, something that's often forgotten. And the big question, so what? You've just des described to me what these people did. So what does it mean? <laughs> Make sure you explain. Okay, now I'm gonna show you my theory essay notes. Here's my language and gender mind map. I would just literally give each theorist, put their name down, put the year, and the briefest, briefest summary of what they did, because you don't have time in an exam to write really long um, sort of descriptions. <gasps> Thumbnail. So then what I would do is I would learn them all, and I would literally take a piece of paper and just write everything down that I could remember um, without looking at anything, and then I'd go back, look back, and see what I'd missed out. Um, a really good thing to do is acrostic poems, is that what they're called? So for example, if I wanted to learn all of the gender theorists, I would take the first letter of each of them, of each of them. so um, R, R, K, Z, N, P, D, D, and I would make a word out of each of the letters. So pedin, pedin is a word I might have come up with, and that would be P-E-D-N. So that would help me remember Pamela Fishman, uh, Eckert, uh, Deborah Tannen and Nelson. Um, so I'd literally just do that and then I could remember... So it's basically triggering your memory. You remember one word, one word, and then you look through that word, take each letter, remember the theorist from that word, then you remember what the theorist has done. So just from remembering one word, you can trigger your memory to remember an entire freaking mind map. <laughs> Here's my one for accent and dialect theory, um, same on the other side too, there you go. On this side I sort of had more um, terminology like accent, dialect, their definitions, estuary English, convergence, divergence, because if estuary English is in the question you need to be able to give it a definition, so make sure you just know what it is. And then on this side I've got all like the case studies and stuff. Oh Lebov, I remember Lebov, what a fun time. Here's my ethnicity mind map, there you go. Um, and here's my one for ethnicity terminology. Look at this big boy. Oh, there's my technology mind map. Um, a lot of people just ask to see my notes, so this is me showing you my notes and then you can pause the screen and read if you really want. Um, but if you don't want to, that's fine. <laughs> Language change was a massive area, so I had quite a few mind maps for that. So this was my page one of language change terminology. So I've got stuff like the equilibrium and dialects model, as well as just normal theorists. Um, so then I've got stuff like the S-curve model and the wave model, functional theory. And then here I've got all the language change terminology and examples. Um, this is something a lot of people forget about. Examples are also really important. Um, so here I've written down words like borrowing, compounding, affixation, back formation, clipping, blending, acronyms, initialisms. Here's my mind map for World Englishes where I was getting more bored because I stopped highlighting. <laughs> um, so all of this, I've actually just got quotes from David Crystal from a TED talk I think he did. Um, so I just watched a YouTube video and took down what I thought were the most relevant quotes, wrote them down, learnt a couple, whacked them out in an essay, looks like you've done some extra research. <laughs> Other World English is one. And I've got examples of like things that have happened, so like Sling Singlish, which was Singapore, Australian English examples of words they did, um, so like <laughs> A definition of what a shit show means, or bees dick of a chance, or built like a brick shit house. Um, examples of Jamaican patois, um, phonology, vocabulary, and grammar. I think that's everything. Oh shit. Okay, so question three, paper two, section B. <clears throat> Establish in your introduction what type of language change are you talking about, e.g semantic change and use that as your focus for question four too probably um, you want to focus on the types of discourses that the writers use use the term discourses regularly um, just like represents in paper one discourse is a key term uh, note the features of language change that are related by, by the way discourse <clears throat> is the type of language used by people to describe language um, you can still bring in grammar and terminology into this question though. If the discourse isn't sort of covered by Aitchison's metaphors or something like that you, that you've learnt, um, you can just say what you think the discourse is yourself. So is it a discourse of... So if you see the words growing or accumulating or increasing, you know it is a discourse of expansion. 
and you'd probably also need to say whether it's a positive or neg negative discourse of expansion, but that's the general idea. You have to summarise the writer's arguments in relation to the topic of change. Also, try not to be political. Um, I struggled with this at one time. Um, <laughs> in my question four that I did once um, in class, uh, I got a good mark on it because everything was good, but my teacher wrote, don't be racist, because um, I started just going on a rant about white middle class old men. Oops. Um, but, you know, if you do that and then your market is a white middle class old man, they might not be too happy with you. Um, which, you know, isn't right and they shouldn't think like that. But just don't be political because you don't want the examiner to not like you for any reason. And also don't make generalisations. Don't say, like, because everyone who reads the Telegraph is a prescriptivist. Because not everyone is, just try not to be, try not to make too many generalisations and avoid politics where you can. Also, do not mix up text A and B, just use the writer's surnames, make sure you're signposting when you're talking about which one, and just so, just so then the examiner knows what you're talking about. You definitely can analyse language features, sort of, that are related to the opinions and discourses. Um, so if you're, like, raises the discourse of expansion again um you could be like this is shown in the whatever type of noun or adjective or word it is you know but make sure you put all words into context like you should have done for paper one um so if you're saying the verb grows make sure you say the verb grows in the declarative sentence blah 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 because you need to be able to prove that it is actually a verb and you're not getting it wrong Again, try and get your phrases and clauses in there, it's always good for the higher bands. Place for your opinion is not in question three, that is in question four, the opinion article. So again, don't get political, don't put your opinion in, simply analyse the two different texts. Cool. Question three, AO4, 15 marks, your links. Um, explicit and continual comparisons across the two texts, think of the big picture. Um, what other text shared concerns and themes? Do they relate to Lexis, semantics, grammar, syntax, ortho ortho orthography, uh, punctuation, or maybe a combination of them all? You have to show a clear understanding of the language discourses that are relevant to the ideas in the text, and whether that's decay, evolution, disease, conflict, blah blah blah. Do the writers use the same, similar, or completely different discourses? Are the writers prescriptivists, descriptivists, or a bit of a mix? AO1 is 10 marks, that's your structure and your terminology. You have to analyse using a range of terms accurately, analyse a range of word classes, phrases, clauses, sentence types and moods, active and passive voice, semantic fields, etc. Uh, your analysis must be precise and focused. You have to write accurately. I made plenty of mistakes before and still got A's not plenty but if you get something wrong it's not the end of the world just try not to put it in if you know it's wrong <laughs> offer a clearly signposted structure so you can sort of navigate between your thoughts and your paragraphs and the ideas in the two different texts so you want to consider things like voice first person third person citing research quoting knowledgeable sources using loaded language sort of so that means like evaluative adjectives or intensifying adverbs um personal opinion Structuring their text to offer two opposing views before landing on one. Um, facts and statistics, humour and irony, anecdotes. You need to think carefully about what is being said, how an argument is constructed by the writer, and how effectively those ideas are presented. If they try to use a pun or irony to explain something, but you don't think it really works and you don't really get it and it's a little bit shit, you can say that. Not every writer is perfect. You can say they tried to do this, but it wasn't as effective as the writer in text two who did this in a different way. Um, that's really good because you're comparing, you're saying they did the same things, but you're evaluating the effectiveness and you're saying one, art one article did this, the other did this, but this one did it better because of this, this and this, and this one did it worse because of this, this and this. Lovely. Um, also think about the context. Um, think about the bigger picture and the wider debate about language. For AO4 you need to show that you can make the connections between the two texts. Um, you don't just want to do it on the simple stuff like audience and purpose. Obviously it's important to make those connections but that shouldn't be all you talk about. When you make relevant and useful connections regarding the language used in text that is level three. To move up to level four 
You must explore how more complex contextual factors could be linked, for example, making connections about how the text use and produce discourses about language. And level five involves an evaluation and critical overview of these connections. So staying on question three, let's go over the AOs. AO1, 10 marks. Apply appropriate methods of language analy analysis using associated terminology and coherent written expression. AO3, 15 marks. Eva analyze and evaluate how context affects meaning. The AO4, 15 marks. Explore connections across texts informed by linguistic concepts and methods. So, in here they write suggestions for further improvement and they sort of circle what you need to improve on. Um, so, here are points that you might need to improve on. Um, clearer written English, more organised structure to your answer, more developed focus on, langu on language discourses, uh, more examples needed, clearer overview of main issues, better linguistic register needed, some errors in language terminology, more coverage of different links, more, exp more detailed explanations needed and a better line of argument. So I just want to show you that on this one I got, what did I say, 38 out of 40 on this question. Um, but you can still see how much annotation my teacher's done on here. Whether it's her saying good or I don't really understand that point, um, you're allowed to make mistakes. Um, so I'll read you the overall comment she gave this essay. She said, Excellent essay that shows an impressive depth of understanding and covers AO1 to a high level. Lots of sophisticated and supported points with a, with a wide range of language features and lots of discussion of discourses. Um, I'll just read a brief bit to you so you sort of get the idea of how to structure an essay maybe. Um, so the question was, analyse how language is used in text A and B to, rep to present views about the nature of language change. So I put, this is my introduction, text A is an online article from The Guardian with the purpose of persuading the reader to agree that the misuse of semantics in Lexis is destroying our language. The text, take, the text takes quite a sarcastic tone and is mixed in terms of register. Text B is an online article from the Daily Telegraph that also seeks to persuade the reader that misusing the word literally in the wrong context will lead to miscommunication. The tone is relatively light-hearted and once again the tenor is mixed. So introduction, quickly, this is the text, this is where it's from, Give it gives it a bit of context, gap it and tone and tenor, tenor it. Um, I go on to say, both texts use a discourse of decay and purity to represent that English language is wonderful. Text A uses predicative adjectives such as ugly in the parenthetical phrase equally ugly to the ear to persuade the reader that changes to the English language are leading to a downfall. The closing imperative main clause, save our literacy, also further implies that our literacy is something worth fighting for. This brings in a conflict discourse. Similarly, text A utilises an extended simile by likening humans to monkeys, suggesting that we are somewhat wild, and the language we speak to a Ming vase, an object of delicacy that ought to be protective. This fits with Aitchison's crumbling castle model. Text B also represents the English language positively. In the quote from Paul Parry, he uses asyndetic listing in the main clause, we've got a wonderful floral language, to clearly and simplistically declare that our language is great. The positive attributive adjective appears to be more effective than the techniques applied to text A because they're simply so clear and unambiguous in their meaning. The declarative form of the simple sentence certainly helps to present the opinion as fact, which is even more persuasive. So there you go. Just in that little paragraph there, I talk about text A, text B, and which one's more effective. And then right at the end, I do do a little conclusion. I say, to conclude, whilst both articles take a negative point of view in reference to the semantic shift of literally, text A uses personal opinion much more strongly, whereas text B presents the opinions of others through quotes. But given the dominance of the quotes in the article and the political ideology of the telegraph, it can be assumed that the writer took a similar standpoint. In terms of persuasion, it seems for the above reason reasons that text A is more persuasive, as it consistently is more certain in its main argument lines, whereas text B uses soft dynamic verbs like slip and doesn't present the writer's personal opinion as clearly. However, it does pose a less aggressive argument of the main issue being about miscommunication. For many, that be, may be more persuasive than a rant-style discourse structure. Um, so I've got another one here where we actually went through... Oh, I'm such a nerd, I hate myself. We went through the class, my, we went through my essay. And we wrote um, what I was doing right, basically, um, and why it got the grade it got. Oh my god, I'm such a nerd. Um, so, uh, here is my introduction. It says, assured start. If you act like you know what you're talking about, you probably do. Define key terms. Always do that. So basically, establish each article. Um, 
begin to bring in a bit of terminology as well you can and explain why it's used and make sure you're linking to context so i go on to say things i've included detailed terminology and i explain why it's used going into that further detail linking it back to context um oppositions differences are explained even though they use the same technique so maybe they've got different discourses but they're using a similar technique in terms of pronouns or adjectives like hyperbole maybe they're both using hyperbole but to get their different discourses and points of view across um, you want to get your high level grammar in, linking it back to purpose, uh, context, comparison, talking about the writer's intentions, a little bit of representation, uh, going right back into sort of paper one stuff for your single word and phrase analysis, talking about the different use of the same word. So I do a whole paragraph um, about how they both use the same fronted adverb, perhaps, um, in order to portray another as less than themselves. However, um, they both use it differently. Just to give you an idea about how I would annotate a text in an exam. Um, so you can see I've got lots of different coloured highlighters. I basically make a key up here. Um, so I kind of pick a discourse or a point and I write it down um, and then colour code it. So then I've got my discourses and the points that I want to make and then I just highlight everything that supports that. Um, I don't think about word classes or anything like that. I just highlight what make sense and then later on I'll go on and figure out what word class it is, what phrase it is. So then when it comes to it I can just go back through, uh, pick the point I need to write about next, find the example and write it all out. Uh, question 4, paper 2, section B. Read the question carefully. If they stipulate a genre, make sure you write in it. I think for the year before us they did stipulate a genre and they told everyone that they weren't going to do that, but they did. Um, but for our year they didn't. So if they don't, you can just use your own. My personal favourite is to go for like an article that you would find in like The Guardian or a blog because that's how I sort of naturally write or did use to before I started studying journalism. Yeah, so just be prepared. Just briefly before the exam, just check what are the features I would include if I was writing a speech. So think about like rhetoric and persuasive techniques, that kind of thing. Don't rant. You can make it persuasive by all means, but back up everything you say with theory and just don't rant. <laughs> don't write like a teenager. Uh, you don't need to put your age in. Um, make it sound like you're more of an expert or like studying the subject. Um, don't be like Alice Priest, aged 18. Be like Alice Priest, a linguist student, uh, argues this. <laughs> <laughs> write with personality, but give your opinion, make sure your opinions are well supported and backed up. Um, back everything up with examples and theory because theory is the big marker and if some people forget that you really knew you need to include theory because that's more marks don't just shove theory in there make sure it flows with your idea do a brief plan before and remember you're writing for a non-specialist audience so if when you're going through there is any word that you use that you wouldn't have known what it meant before you started studying english language put a little asterisk put in the brackets a definition of the word because it's for a non-specialist audience they have no clue what you're talking about so make sure you teach them <laughs> use the topic areas that were discussed in the articles and respond to them um i've written here don't diss the writers um don't use expletives and don't call them complete idiots um because <laughs> that's offensive <laughs> rather than complete idiots you could say so-called literary experts um a subtle diss but not calling them dumb necessarily the best responses i put here challenge the opinions and argument of the writers in the article but with good humor and the best essays are also the easiest to follow structure everything one thought per paragraph one argument per paragraph that kind of thing so for level five which is 17 to 20 marks for ao2 um AO2 being demonstrate critical understanding of concepts and issues relevant to language use. Students will demonstrate a synthesised, conceptualised and individual overview of issues, evaluate and challenge views, approaches and interpretations of linguistic issues. And um, for AO5, for 9 to 10 marks, level 5, uh, students will use form creatively and innovatively, use register creatively for context and write accurate, accurately. Here's an example question. Write an opinion article about gender representations in which you assess the ideas raised in text A and B and can and argue your own views. Um, so it needs to be lively, engaging, but have sensible points, bring in relevant theory, refer to arguments in the articles for question 3, 
um, give a balanced argument so you can acknowledge different views. Um, even if it's a view you really don't agree with, just bring it in and be like, some people might say this and use this model to back it up because of course bringing theory is really important. And if your opinion doesn't have much theory to support it, talk about the other side of you and then just be like, but that's all rubbish afterwards. <laughs> um, and think about the relationship with the reader and elements of rhetoric persuasive devices. Uh, remember, it's a non-specialist audience. So use just use loads and loads of theory. I cannot stress this so much. Just use so much theory in this one, but explain everything. You get so many more marks with theory than being good at writing. So just squish the theory in. Create a narrative of your overall story. Present an argument and like weave your theory into that. Don't, don't just come out with it. Make sure it's justified to be there. So here I've got one that I got an A grade on. And I got 20 out of 30 on this one. Um, the comment was an entertaining and informative article that has real personality. It made me laugh, which is always a good sign that you've struck the right balance. Balance. You could perhaps embed theory a bit more, but it is still a great piece. So this is one that I did closer to exam time. So I think this is a better one to sort of take inspiration from. Um, and starting with a strong opening is always good. So in this one, this was about the word literally. My headline was, it literally doesn't matter. And then I've sort of got, um, and I start by saying so-called inappropriate use of the word literally has recently been highlighted by John Sutherland and John Paul Forge Rogis. Student Alice Priest argues a non-standard use of literally is less an element of decay but rather one of evolution. Then I go on. It is literally colder than the Arctic. It's literally raining cats and dogs. I literally died. Did you understand what I meant in the preceding sentences? Was my clearly inept ability to communicate getting in the way? According to the Guardian and Daily Telegraph, it is, a it is metaphorical comments such as those that I just made that are ruining the English language. Yes, you heard me right. I, Alice Priest, am single-handedly eroding and corrupting the English language to the extent that it will be irretrievable and eventually I will altogether lose the ability to communicate. Sound realistic? Nah, I didn't think so either. I'd like to get to the root of this problem. What causes these middle-aged white men to slam the language of the youth as if we are out to destroy the very core of British values? A language theorist by the name of Aitchison proposed three metaphors that describe how some uptight individuals feel about language change. The first is the crumbling castle. This, this idea is that the English language is as precious as a historic hilltop castle and that as a nation we are eroding the beauty and prestige of such treasures. The second is a damp spoon. The idea suggests that laziness is the cause of language change rather than, I don't know, a natural evolution that comes with the need for new words. I mean, what else would we call a podcast or iPad if we were never allowed to make neologisms, brackets, new words. The third and final metaphor is the infectious disease. Yes, you heard it. Somehow the misuse of literally is passed around like the flu, slowly lowering the IQ of those unfortunate to contract the illness of dun 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 non-standard grammar. So there you see. Again, I'm using theory, but I'm not just talking about it as if I'm quoting it from a book. I'm making it more interesting. I'm using humour. I don't know, maybe you disagree. Um, <laughs> but that's what I did anyway. I hope that was of some help. Um, you'll be absolutely fine in the exam. I know you will. The fact you're watching this video shows that you care enough um, to research into it. I know this video is going to be really long because I've been recording for at least an hour, which means a lot of editing for me. I need to be revising right now. Ah. <laughs> uh, make sure you subscribe to my channel for more revision videos. I'm moving to America this summer for Camp America, so subscribe for more content about that. And also study with me is because I will be doing a lot of studying over the next few days. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna show you my floor, just you know, so you can appreciate. This is all, hello, oh, oh wait, there's more, there's more, look at all of that, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I hope you appreciate that mess, because it's all for you! <laughs> anyway, I need to go, I'm going delusional, okay, bye! <laughs>